<clears throat> well, I'd like to start, start by thanking the organizers very much indeed for inviting me. I thought that was a very powerful speech. It was a very illuminating speech. And it's a speech for which I have tremendous respect. It's also a speech that was very <clears throat> categorical and <laughs> even polarizing. <laughs> and given that I think we agree that we know very little about how memory is stored, perhaps we don't need to be quite so rigid <laughs> at this point in time. We've been told that the mechanism of memory must be essentially molecular. We've been told that encoding happens through spike trains and therefore must be um, stored through a form of Shannon information similar to how our computers work. We've been told that if we are to understand memory and the brain that we must approach it from a design or an engineering perspective. All of this is wrong. <laughs> Every single one of those statements is wrong. We cannot and should not approach the brain from the perspective of design. We do not have to accept that information can only be stored as Shannon conceived. Spike trains are definitely necessary but are certainly not sufficient to explain how memory is, or information is, is coded in the brain. And given all the above, there's no reason yet to think that the engram is essentially molecular in nature. I'm going to offer an alternative perspective on how memory might be stored in a way that is isomorphic with instinct, on how information in general could be stored in the brain. But before I begin, I'd like to concede the major points made in the previous talk. Memory is information, and it is not stored by changes in synaptic weight. That hypothesis has been falsified by a number of very clear studies. We also agree that the coding problem is the essential problem, and we need to move away from simply understanding the biological processes and the physiological activities that correlate with memory or are necessary for memory and really deal with the question about how specific memories are encoded as information. But in doing so, we cannot think of design. Why? Because the brain evolved. I need to say that again, the brain evolved. And the process of memory and most of what the brain was doing were basically things that organisms were doing before we had recognizable nervous systems in the last common ancestor of kinidarians and bilaterians. Since then, the brain has been evolving both at a molecular level and at a circuit level. And it's been basically hodgepodging its way through the world surviving, not, not so succinctly designed as a computer. And because of this, we have to understand that the kind of information the brain uses may be very different from Shannon information. Now, Shannon information is a wonderful invention. It's absolute, idealized. It's all about signal fidelity and noise reduction, and it can represent anything in the world. It has no informational content itself, but it refers to whatever information you're interested in. This is why it's so useful to us. But it's also very expensive. It takes a lot of work to keep it in a high, in high, in a high fidelity form. And it's not very easily to modify according to what would we be required from daily behavior. And if you were to take this analogy of what if we were to compare encoding an entire Looney Tunes cartoon, we'll say a 72 minute one that I downloaded the other day. Uh, in Shannon information terms, I need between 220 and 260 megabytes to store that on my laptop. But if I download Ulysses and I paste it into a Word file, I only need 0.8 megabytes. Now, I think Ulysses is a bit more complicated than the cartoon. But the types of, Im the types of images that we see in a simple cartoon, depending on the resolution you want, are more akin to what we would have evolved to have to deal with. The basic affordances that we need for survival, perception, action, and a basic heuristic for integrating the two. And so I borrow heavily from a concept of semantic information introduced recently by Daniel Dennett. Semantic information, of which Shannon information is a subset, basically means information that is worth knowing, something that justifies a representation. I am standing here on the podium. 
that is information about me. And you can encode it conceivably without having to reduce it to Shannon form. And, similar, and similarly, the kind of information that would have evolved throughout our evolution, though it is based on genetics, has to be rapidly accessible to our brains and does not need to have the very precise degree of resolution that Shannon information affords. So information as we encode it in our brains, whatever the mechanism, may not be quantifiable as units. The other point to be made here is that Shannon information is very much tied to the encoding mechanism, not just the coding mechanism. The coding mechanism, of course, is how information is stored in the brain. The encoding mechanism is how we write it. And when we learn, I think it's very clear we learn entirely through spike trains. But that is not all the information we have in our brains. We are also born with particular instincts, particular ways of doing things. That does not come from spike trains. That comes from our genes. It comes through developmental biology, an entirely different encoding mechanism, but with the same effect on the brain. And given all of this, I'm proposing that a more straightforward way of understanding memory in the brain may simply be a gross anatomical microcircuitry change that accounts for an engram, an imprint of learning and that this can be equally accessed by genetics, by genetic mutation. Now the concept of the engram was originally proposed by Richard Semon, a 19th century German zoologist. And he conceived that the engram would be a change in an irritable substance that would allow information to be carried forward in the lifetime of the organism. And he also posited that particular cells would be attributed to particular engrams. And this approach has been ignored for quite some time, mainly because we didn't have the technology to be looking in an experimental, empirical way of how particular memories may be encoded. And that's changed in the last five to ten years due to the, due to the, um, due to the generation of what we call memory engram technology, which is basically the synthesis of a transgenic method for labeling cells that have been active in a particular time with optogenetics, which allows for the reversible manipulation of particular cells in vivo. Now, the first demonstration of memory engram labeling in the hippocampus was done in the Tanagawa lab at MIT, where I worked as a postdoc, and has been reproduced by a number of other labs around the world. And the basic idea, which I don't have time to go into, is that through a combination of transgenics and viral vectors, we can label particular cells that were active in a particular brain region at a time of learning, and then manipulate them thereafter in awake behaving mice. And by activating these cells, we can induce the recall of specific memories. We can also inhibit the natural recall of specific memories and we can study the biology of these cells. And the real strength of this preparation is that we can study both the function and the biology of memory engram cells in, this, in a single experimental preparation, and that has not previously been possible. This, these are what engram cells look like when they're labeled in the mouse hippocampus. They're sparse, that's the most important thing to note here. A particular contextual engram generally occupies between four and six percent of granule cells in the dendrite gyrus of the hippocampus. And so how do we use engram cells in order to actually get at how they're encoding memory? How do we use this technology to learn something about how these cell ensembles are somehow contributing to specific information storage? One approach has been to look at amnesia. Now the way we understand the biology of memory is largely by inducing amnesia. We disrupt a brain region or a gene using a drug or whatever manipulation you want, and you look for amnesia in the organism. And so you then conclude that said process or said gene is important for the storage of memory. But any given case of amnesia has an a priori ambiguity, and that is that the information may be lost. It may be that the book has been burned and you're never getting the information back. Alternatively, an equally possible situation is that the memory is still there in the library, the book is just misplaced and you don't know where to find it. So we attempted to answer some of some, this question for some cases of amnesia by inducing retrograde amnesia, either by drug treatment or the genetic induction of Alzheimer's disease. And in both cases, we created normal experimental amnesia in the rodents, as other people have published. But then when we directly stimulated these cells, the engram cells, the memory came out. So the information was still present in the brain. What this means is that many of the putative 
biological substrates of memory storage may in fact be there more for the access to the memory, but the memory informational content itself survives. What else survived? One correlate we've seen when looking at engram cells is that they specifically connect to each other across brain regions in a specific pattern. This pattern of engram cell connectivity survives amnesia. And activating this pattern is what allows us to get the memory out, even in cases of amnesia, whether by drug treatment or <coughs> Alzheimer's disease. So I propose that the subtle anatomical connections between engram cells may be a way of storing information in an engram. If you walk into the neuroscience building at MIT and you look up, this is what you'll see. About 100 golden neurons suspended from the ceiling, a very nice sculpture by Ralph Helmick. But if you then climb the stairs and you look down at it from a certain perspective, this is what you see. <laughs> Where is the engram for that image? Is it inside the brain cells? I don't think so. I think it's an emergent property <laughs> that manifests itself through synaptic connections, but not at synaptic connections. It manifests itself through a particular constellation of neuronal cells giving information that is rapidly accessible to an organism that is struggling to survive and to reproduce in its environment. And based on this, the model that me and my collaborators are proposing is that learning induces synaptic connections, not, not just changes in synaptic connections, but induces new synaptic connections to form. And the stable connectivity between these cells, the new stable connectivity is what is encoding information. Now, when you, pr when you present this theory to neurobiologists, they immediately ask you, well, how is the memory maintained for your entire life? If you've disrupted all the molecules that we know keep a memory there, how can you possibly maintain this memory in the absence of those players? This is an aerial photo of the, or a photo actually from outer space of the city of Berlin taken by Chris Hadfield. Um, it was taken 20 years after they tore down the wall. But yet you can still see the divide between East Berlin and West Berlin very clearly based on the street lighting used. In West Berlin, they tend to use the more environmentally friendly mercury lighting, and in East Berlin, they still use sodium lighting. And it's not because they haven't maintained or changed the light bulbs since 1989. <laughs> it's because the setup was already there, and they've been replacing them according to a structure that was already in place. And by the same way, memory encoded as changes in the anatomy of the brain could be maintained for the rest of your life without any special molecules, just by rejuvenating the normal connections that are there by normal neuronal homeostasis in the same way that all of our genetically encoded connections are maintained our own life, our whole life, without any special apparatus. And this brings us on to the integration of memory and instinct. Now, we all know that memory builds on our instincts, but it must be, memory must be able to talk to our instincts. And it seems intuitive to me that if memory and instinct are to talk to each other, then they need to be stored in a form of information that is isomorphic, that is of the same language. And recently, scientists working in Richard Axel's lab in Columbia and also David Anderson's lab at Caltech have shown using the exact same methodology as we've been using for engrams, that they can map the circuitry for particular instinctual behaviors, all the way from perception to motor output, the label lines that are encoded genetically at birth. Instincts are encoded by specific neuronal constellations that are coded for in your genome, but you won't find numbers there. Now, how does this relate to memory? Well, we know that memory builds on our instincts. That's obvious. But what if our instincts are really just copies of our memory? I don't mean in a Lamarckian sense, but what if the Baldwin effect is, can be manifest through an isomorphism between instinct and memory? The Baldwin effect explains ex how habitual learned behavior in a population can translate into instinct. So imagine you have mice that are not afraid of cats and are unable to learn that cats are bad. 
If they get a random mutation that says you should be afraid of cat urine, that happens very slowly. It would take a long time for it to come to fixation in a population. And those mice essentially would not do very well, and they would exist in an ecosystem where there were no cats. So if you take an example, which I think is more plausible, where standard mice, when they first encounter a cat-like animal, or when any prey animal en encounters a predator, can form an engram by experience or by social interaction that says, this thing is bad, we need to get away from it. They will be forming a particular connectivity pattern in their anatomy that says, crucial piece of information, we need to avoid this particular predator. And that engram is going to become necessary. It's going to become necessary, it will be driven to fixation. Every individual in the population will have to learn it or die. And then, given that population, where everyone is learning something that is culturally homogenous, that has to be known, an individual comes along with a random mutation that changes the innate microcircuitry of the brain that just happens to copy the structure of the existing engram in the population. It will then pass it on to its children and to their children, and they will then compete with the not so fortunate mice who have to do the hard work and learn the engram for themselves. And when you have this competition, the privileged mice who inherited an ingram, knowing, how, knowing that they need to invite, uh, uh, avoid cats in this case, will outcompete the others and the predators will do better by focusing on the prey animals who have to form the engrams for themselves. And in this sense, Instinct and memory can be seen as continuous and must be coded by the same informational substrate. I cannot imagine how that is done at a molecular level. This leads to a final conclusion or a final rather working model that we go from a blank state to a learned state by either a process of learning or evolution, but that the product from the perspective of the animal is essentially the same. Much of the work which I drew on here was done by the Tanagawa lab at MIT, which is still going strong, but now I have the privilege of competing with them, <laughs> and I need a lot of help. So if people are interested in joining the lab as students or as postdocs, please get in touch. We're funded by the European Research Council, because we're still in the European Union. <laughs> we're, we're also generously we're also generously funded by our own government. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> and, and we're also funded by the Jacobs Foundation because they're very nice people. <laughs> and in conclusion, I'd just like to say that while polar, polarizing discussions can be valuable and entertaining, they can be destructive at a certain point. And if we keep to the facts, if we stick to the facts, then we may find that our views have more in common than we anticipated. Thank you very much. <laughs>